Welcome everybody to CPIX, the Catholic Parent Involvement Committee for the Halton and Catholic District School Board's webinar presentation of Depression, Anxiety, and Drugs, Oh My. My name is Josh Davistein. I'm the chair of CPIC, and with me is Lisa Koster. She is the past chair of CPIC, doing the technical support with me tonight. Um, Gary Derenfeld is going to present for us tonight. He is a social worker. Courts in Ontario consider him an expert in social work, marital and family therapy, child development, parent-child relations, and custody and access matters. Gary is the host of the TV reality show Newlywed and Nearly Dead and the parenting columnist for the Hamilton Spectator. He's the author of The Marriage Rescue, as well as hundreds of other articles related to personal, family, and married life. Gary maintains a private practice in Dundas, Ontario, providing a range of services for people in distress. He speaks in conferences and workshops throughout North America, and tonight it's my pleasure to introduce him here to you for our presentation tonight. Gary. Or can't help you manage the problem, uh, even never having seen your son or daughter, and and certainly in many instances I'm able to do that. Um, and and then you know having met with the parents, if there's a real good reason for meeting uh, with their child, I I will do so. Uh, by way of example, though, you you phone up a surgeon and say I have a pain in my side. Would you do an appendectomy? Hopefully that surgeon says. Um, let me take a CAT scan before I go stabbing. So, so by meeting with the parents first, that's my version of doing a CAT scan before I have to stab anyone. There's also good reasons for parents to check out the counselor, quite frankly. Uh, we're not all cut of the same cloth, even though we all may be called a social worker, a psychologist, or a counselor, a child and youth worker, or a, uh, whatever. Um, you want to make sure that we have our heads screwed on straight quite frankly, because we don't all have our own heads screwed on straight. You want to also make sure that our values are consistent with your own. I recognize that I am talking uh, to uh, a Catholic crowd tonight. And so imagine you're bringing your 14-year-old daughter to a counselor because she's either sexually active or pregnant. And so the value base of that counselor may figure prominently in your choice. Um, I'm going to put it out there, like me or not, I, I, with respect to abortion, I'm pro-choice. And so if I was meeting with your, your daughter on a pregnancy issue, you may not appreciate the range of alternatives that I may chat to her about. And, and I'm not trying to say good or bad, right or wrong, I'm just saying these these are our different values, and from a counseling perspective, our different values may figure prominently in terms of your choice of counselor. Also on drugs and alcohol, um, broadly speaking, drug and alcohol counselors fall into one of two camps. One being uh, abstinence, no, you shouldn't be doing drugs, and you're underage, so you shouldn't be doing alcohol whatsoever, and that's the starting point. The other uh, starting point for some drug and alcohol counselors is from a position of harm reduction, which I euphemistically refer to as, uh, I know you're going to drink or smoke up anyway, so now let's talk about how to do it safely or how to do it in a way that, pr that, that reduces risk. And so I'm more the former, not the latter. If I were to meet with a child, uh, drugs or alcohol are off the table. I don't think there is any right way to do it. I think any amount is harmful and risky behavior in youth. So while I know they still may be doing it, I'm not going to tacitly give a child the impression that it may be acceptable uh, by taking the position of harm reduction versus abstinence. So folks, you know, I, I encourage you to know who your counselor is, see the counselor first. Uh, check the counselor out, let the ch counselor check you out uh, before you bring your uh, youngster in for um, counseling. <coughs> Depression, anxiety, and drugs, oh my. So people do phone me up and really what they're talking about is behavior. Um, we're having trouble controlling our son or daughter, our son or daughter isn't going to school, our son or daughter is using uh, marijuana, uh, and or harder drugs or alcohol. Uh, I gotta tell you, marijuana is the drug of choice uh, with 
underage teens, uh, under 19, uh, because it's, it's easier to get than alcohol. Uh, so they're more apt to get dope than they are to get booze. If they have uh, an of age uh, brother or sister, uh, that tends to be one of the uh, easiest uh, ways for an underage teen to get, uh, to get alcohol or, of course, to water down their parents' supply and to use that. So the call comes in, they're worried about a, a teenager's behavior. Uh, more often than not, there is parent-teen uh, conflict. And uh, it may be over the drugs, over homework, over school attendance, uh, non-compliance, not chipping in at home, watching too much video games. And a parent may not realize that underneath that may be uh, depression and, and or anxiety. When we think of depression and, and anxiety, we tend to take a more adult perspective. And so we think of depression and we think of someone in a state of sadness, being sullen, uh, um, quiet to themselves, a black cloud over their head, uh, somewhat moody, um, despondent, lethargic. And you know what, that, that's pretty much a good symptom list for adult depression. When we think of anxiety, we think uh, maybe of some hand wringing, some heart palp excuse me, palpitations, um, uh, this, this fear of something either specific and or generalized, and uh, a lot of thoughts racing through our heads. Uh, I know I can't, I know I can't, or I know I can't, I know I can't, or it's going to get me, it's going to get me, or I can't, you know, uh, I'm not going to fit in, I'm not going to fit in. And again, the, this is certainly symptomatic of adult uh, anxiety. It's important to know that when, when dealing with uh, children and teenagers, depression and anxiety presents very differently uh, a lot of the time. It presents as irritability, contrariness, that's a, that's a big one, <coughs> excuse me, this kind of oppositional contrariness, I have a chip on my shoulder, don't bug me, get the hell out of my way, you can't tell me what to do, uh, and anxiety as well, uh, the, this just kind of persnicketiness, um, these, the, you know, you may see that adult style of depression and anxiety, but, but quite often in the adolescent, it is, it is that persnicketiness, um, uh, chip on the shoulder, grouchy, uh, you can't win for losing, you know, you say, hey, you look good today, what, you didn't like me the other day, uh, almost posed and ready for a fight. And so it can be confusing to parents to consider uh, that their son or daughter underneath that may be depressed or anxious about something. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking you can see my screen here, so depression, anxiety, drugs online. I, I wanted to deliver this uh, chat uh, webinar, even that word, I think webinar, it sounds so weird, webinar. <clears throat> I wanted to deliver this webinar in the context of uh, summer's coming. And so you look at that first slide, school's out, entertain us. Uh, kids who are depressed, anxious, uh, and or uh, using and abusing drugs, they tend not to be engaged uh, in activities outside the home, uh, apart from hanging out with their friends, uh, doing the drugs, or playing video games. And so I, I just want to go on record as saying those are not activities. Um, when we want our kids engaged in activities, it is something that is organized. It involves other persons of a similar age. There is typically um, some skill uh, development, instruction involved, or some play uh, to the activity. Um, and we really want our kids involved in activities. If your kid is heading into this summer and there's nothing planned, the likelihood of depression, anxiety worsening, the likelihood of drug 
use, abuse, escalating, uh, is off the chart. Off the chart. So school's out, entertain us. It's not your job to entertain your kid. I'm not suggesting that. But for goodness sakes, um, you know, I, and I'll likely come back to this, we do want your kids to be well engaged in activities this summer. Activities are protective against depression, anxiety, and drug use. It's hard to be withdrawn, it's hard to be chippy when you are having to focus on something, you know, typically of interest. Um, it's hard to do drugs. Doing drugs is typically incompatible with uh, hockey camp, sports camp, horseback riding, arts and crafts, um, music, uh, learning to play the piano or the guitar, rock climbing, or whatever have you. So uh, we want to get the kids out of the basement, out of the bedrooms, from behind the screens and into uh, activities. <coughs> I'm just scratching my side here, if you can see me on the webcam. Not that you need to know that, those who can't see me. And, and uh, again, this is weird for me, doing this webinar thing. I'm used to people looking back at me and we're chatting back and forth for some of that. So, so I appreciate your patience with me this evening. I want to talk about um, this drug use for a bit. Uh, First of all, it's been said many times, many ways, uh, cigarettes, that's, that's one of the first chief gateway drugs. Uh, cigarettes, uh, tobacco is a drug, it is addictive, it is a legal substance, parents smoke, parents are doing a legal substance, parents are addicted to the substance, children have access to the substance, seeing the substance used is normalized. And so it really is a gateway drug, and it's a gateway drug to um, cannabis, and it is a gateway drug to alcohol. So if your son or daughter is smoking cigarettes already, we have a level of risk that we're going to assign to them that says they are at risk uh, for being consumers of um, illicit drugs and alcohol. Of this marijuana use, if your son or daughter is depressed or anxious, many kids, uh, well, I, I would venture to say all kids, I know that's a gross generalization, but play with me for a minute. Uh, all kids, uh, they don't have insight. They don't sit there and go, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. They just feel what they're feeling. Truth be known, you know, most of us as adults are the same way. We're not sitting there self-reflecting minute to minute. How do I feel? What's underneath this feeling? Um, what's going on for me? We, we just feel what we feel and we kind of go forth until somebody says, why are you so grouchy or why are you so, so grumpy or why are you down in the dumps? <clears throat> so here's our, our son or daughter and they may be feeling out of sorts, not knowing what to do with that. And so the use of, of alcohol or or uh, marijuana is a form of self-medicating with, with drugs that are readily available to them. And so you may start with a, um, your first experience of getting high on dope, and it's typically in a, a group of others, and just being in a group of others helps mitigate issues of depression and anxiety. It makes us feel more comfortable. And then as we're high, we notice that we're not as bothered by the symptoms of, of depression and anxiety, and, and uh, that feels kind of nice. And as that feels kind of nice, we contrast that to when we're not high, which doesn't feel so nice. So it's, it's no surprise that, that smoking up and, and doing drugs and, and alcohol um, one would succumb to that because it feels better than feeling disheveled, upset, cranky, grumpy, or down. What the teen doesn't realize, and sometimes adults as well, is that we grow dependent on these substances. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say addicted, 
in, in the sense that uh, I'm going to go through withdrawal if I stop smoking dope, but we certainly grow dependent, which means psychologically I really want to be on the substance because I, I just feel better. I feel more at ease, less disease uh, than not. And and here's the rub with, with particularly choosing, well, either drugs or alcohol. And, and when I talk about drugs right now, I'm mostly talking about um, marijuana, cannabis, hash, hash oil. <clears throat> Firstly, with, with uh, alcohol, it's a central nervous system depressant. It, 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 it sedates our central nervous it, it lowers us down. And if you're already down, even though the that sense of inebriation may feel up and in, intoxicating, uh, it winds up uh, adding to the depression. So it's that double-edged sword. It helps and feels good to a short and small extent, but it is also contributing to the depression. And, and with the marijuana, uh, you know, the issue there, that there's something that we call amotivational syndrome a motivational syndrome. The more you smoke up, the more apathetic you get. Um, I call it lack of gumption. You know, you see these kids, they talk, oh, I just want a veg, man. Well, maybe I'm dating myself to the 60s or 70s. That's the language uh, that was used back in my day. I think it's still used today. But the reason people are vegging is because of the apathy that's generated from chronic uh, cannabis, cannabis abuse, that amotivational syndrome. So if you already are depressed and anxious, you're having trouble coping and concentrating at school, you're not getting along with your parents, and then you're, you're smoking up and or doing uh, alcohol, you're inadvertently compounding your problems uh, chemically, uh, biochemically. And, uh, and then as if that's not bad enough, as soon as you do that, you're in less of a position to attend to the daily tasks at hand. Well, what are the daily tasks at hand? Uh, school, part-time job, chores around the house. So as you're no longer getting your schoolwork done, eventually those walls come crashing in around you. If you're not having a part-time job, how are you getting your money? And if you're not doing your chores at home, you're in conflict again with your parents. So we see this kind of spiral of um, I'm not feeling so great. I succumb to drugs and alcohol as a psychological uh, crutch. I grow dependent. Then I suffer the side effects of that dependency, which includes further withdrawal from school, uh, failure, conflict with parents, acting out with parents, and in some cases, violence and aggression, uh, the result of conflict with parents and big arguments about, you don't understand me. And then, sadly, the kids all take to the internet and find all sorts of crap to support a position that uh, cannabis uh, use is, is fine. So I'm willing to bet that of the folks listening in on this, I don't know. I, I probably described home life for for some of you listening into this at least. Uh, give me half a second. Um, I'm just setting up one of the poll questions. Gary, can I interrupt yeah. you for one second? Um, you might not sure. be able to see it, but people have asked questions. Oh. They're, on this, they're on your screen. Under right above the chat, you'll see a tab called Questions. And then on the right, you'll see Thank an you. X. On, uh, don't click the X, but right beside the X is a little arrow. And if you click on an arrow, that all the questions will open up for you. Hmm. It is a tiny, tiny box that I'm trying to scroll to the top. I see. It's a tiny box to read those questions. So bear with me, folks. And so you also want me to talk about cutting. One person says they can't hear anything. I can't do any of that. No video feed. I'm not on video to everyone. It's the first 500. Um, anything technical somebody, has been taken care of. Oh, yay. Okay. 
is this <laughs> webinar suitable for my child? Th this webinar is directed to the adults, folks. And I hear that you're not all Catholic, so that's, uh, that's fine either way. A lot of video games, I'm not happy about that. What do you think I should do? Do you think he has anxiety or depression? Uh, you can't force me to do something I don't want to do. Uh, all right, so that, that's helpful to me. Thank you. Uh, can a child be predisposed to to, the, to uh, anxiety and depression? So, so uh, gee whiz, I love getting your questions. Uh, yeah, kids can be predisposed uh, from a biological point of view to anxiety and depression if, if it's uh, seen in the parents. But interestingly enough, apart from, because this is what we'll see in in adopted offspring, that if the parent is depressed or anxious, that it, there's also an elevated risk for the adopted offspring. So you don't have to have necessarily the biological uh, underpinnings of the parent to experience depression or anxiety. Uh, just being around somebody who's depressed and ang anxious, you can kind of um, pick up on that symptomology as well. Those parents who's wondering, you know, you can't make me uh, uh, under take an activity. I, I'm not encouraging you to get into fighting matches with your kids whatsoever. I usually turn to kids and say, I think your life is miserable. I don't think you have fun. And really, I'd like you to have more fun. And so it's not, I don't, I don't get into criticizing the kid for not being in, into activities. I, I more lament with them that I think their life uh, is boring. And there's more to life than sitting around doing video games and uh, smoking dope. And so to that end, um, I'm going to say, let's go, and maybe let's go together. And so sometimes, parents, you, you have to take more of the bull by the horns, be more of an initiator, be more active in that. At the end of the day, you do have some, uh, I'm Jewish, so I'll teach you some Jewish words, some schlap, some pull. Um, you know, you can go on strike, withhold a few services. I'm not saying to punish your kid, but to say, look, there's consequences. No, we're not going to let you do this, that, or the other thing in the absence of these other things going on. And I'm not doing that as a big stick to hit you over the head with it to punish you. It's just that uh, life has to be balanced, and I'm not inclined to do these things, aiding and abetting you for not doing these other things. So we do want to engage the kids, and typically when we want to engage kids in activities, we're looking at things that may be uh, inherently of interest to them, not to us. And some of these kids, um, they wind up getting into high-risk activities, and half the activities we're talking about may be boring to them. So you may want to engage your kid in something more uh, stimulating. It might be scuba diving. It might be uh, rock climbing. It might be skydiving. Uh, you may think I'm, I'm nuts uh, saying something like skydiving. Truth of the matter is, it's a very safe sport. It's uh, safer than crossing the street. Uh, fewer, fewer deaths per capita per number from skydiving than there is crossing the street. I just want you to find a way to engage um, your kids. <clears throat> uh, give me a second. I'm just looking at some of these other things of yours. All right. We got a number more that have um, come in too. Yay! It really is awkward for me to see this. I literally see four words at a time, or you six words at a time. You can click on the little box in the right-hand corner and pop it out, and that should make it bigger. And then you can make it a bigger uh, box oh, if you'd like. No, let's see here. Um, hmm. Can you see it any better that way? Uh, uh, you should be able to drag the bottom right-hand corner and make it bigger, and then you can see everybody's question much easier. I should, should I? Thank you. Okay. Um, to our audience, I apologize. This is me getting used to uh, being on a webinar, uh, but that was very helpful instruction from Lisa. So, so again, you know, if you think your son or daughter is anxious or depressed, before you haul them off to the doctor or counselor, you go first 
and talk these things over with your doctor or counselor. Uh, uh, share with them your concerns. The other thing a good counselor will do is they're going to examine the parental relationship. They're going to examine uh, the parental history with respect to anxiety and depression uh, too, to see is there a biological component, is there a family social uh, component to this. We know that kids whose parents uh, abuse drugs or alcohol, they are at substantially higher risk of depression and anxiety themselves. We know kids whose parents are depressed, they're at more risk of depression. Uh, we know kids whose parents are in conflict and that could be an intact household or separated parents. Uh, parental conflict in and of itself is also associated uh, with depression. So just to let you know those, those things. When we talk about depression, and again, we want to meet with parents first, the good counselor is going to try and figure out, and again, in broad strokes, is this in two fancy dancy words, is this an endogenous depression or exogenous, endogenous versus exogenous. An endogenous depression means that there's something inherent to the child alone that's creating the depression. So we look at their life and their family and the circumstance and we say, you know what? Nice parents, they get along, no drug alcohol use. They're otherwise reasonably happy. Maybe there was a, a, a grandparent to the child who suffered depression or anxiety. And, um, and so, you know, we're at a loss to explain from situational factors why this child may be depressed. And so then we'll say, you know, it, it's likely uh, endogenous. It's something in, uh, unique to the child. And if it's endogenous, uh, there's quite strongly uh, a biochemical component to that, and we're more apt to think in terms of a medication uh, to resolve that depression. If we think of an exogenous depression, well, maybe that uh, child's parents isn't getting along. Uh, they've recently separated or they've separated long ago, but the fight hasn't stopped. Uh, there's a parent who's abusing drugs or alcohol. That's uh, an issue in the family. Uh, or maybe the teen had uh, um, a boyfriend or girlfriend and that relationship has broken up. And so these are more situational factors, things outside of the teen, and hence we would say that's an exogenous depression. And these kinds of things are more amenable to treatment through counseling. And it may be the parents who are getting the counseling to resolve the issues befalling the teen, or it may be the teen directly in terms of how to manage the fallout from a, a broken relationship or upset with, uh, with family issues at home. So, so, you know, when we're thinking of, of what's the treatment of choice, <clears throat> it's not always, the, the treatment isn't always directed at the teens. Sometimes it's, uh, oftentimes it's directed to the parents. And if we are going to think medication, uh, we have to have a good reason for that. We have to have some some hypothesis that it's at least in part endogenously driven. Fancy dancy uh, clinical terms and quite frankly not all the clinicians even know these terms. So you want to be careful who you chat with. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of kerfuffle in the media, the public press about the use of medication for depression and anxiety in teenagers. There is a concern in some class of medications that it increases the risk of suicide or suicidal ideation in teens. Um, I got to tell you that the research, the hardcore research that actually is available on that is not good. So we cannot really draw definitive um, conclusions that if your son or daughter is on an antidepressant, they're at greater risk of suicide. Okay? The other issue with the research on that is we're looking at kids who are already depressed and suicidal. So we don't know if now they're suicidal or, or, or worse, the results of the medication or because that was the course of their uh, depressive illness. So those are other issues there. 
it's important to know that if your son or daughter is prescribed an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication, and sometimes it's the same medication for both disorders, for goodness sakes, you have to take this class of medication exactly as, as prescribed. I want to use some metaphors to explain why antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication uh, is good, is helpful, how it works, uh, how, how people experience a benefit from this. If you think of depression as being in a pool of water, there you are in a pool of water and you're treading water or the water is up to your chin, so you can kind of stand on your tippy toes and still breathe. And if you want to move through that pool, you're kind of slugging through, there's, there's resistance. And so that's depression. When you're trying to move through life, there's just this resistance, this heaviness. Everything takes that much more effort, and hence it's aggravating and fatiguing. Again, in adolescence, you're more apt to see the, the aggravation. In grown-ups, you're more apt to see the fatigue and the sadness. The anxiety part is, again, imagine you're in, in this pool with water up to your chin, and some bugger wants to do a, a, a cannonball at the other side of the pool, you see the wave coming towards you, and, and darn it, there's nothing you can do. That wave is going to overwhelm you. It's going to engulf you. You're going to uh, lose your breath. That's anxiety. Uh, and for those who, you know, depression and anxiety, I don't have the wherewithal to go through the water. I'm worried about being engulfed, and I'm overwhelmed. And so, so here I am in this pool, this is the depression, this is the anxiety. Now, medication. What is the role of medication? If you think of medication as the plug in the bottom of the pool, the plug holds the water in. Well, we pull the plug, lo and behold, the, 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 the water level of that pool starts to go down slowly by the way, slowly. It does go whoosh down. It goes down very, very slowly. And you know, by the time the water gets to your chest, you think, oh, okay, if that if that so and so does a cannonball, I'm not worried about being overwhelmed anymore. It's still a pain to get through the water. There's still a lot of resistance, but I'm not gonna get engulfed. I'm not gonna drown. Now, if that water goes to my waist or or better still, if that water goes to my knees, what a relief, because now I can splash through the water, I can get done what I have to get done, I don't feel held back, I'm not fatigued, and you know, you can do as many cannonballs as you want, uh, I'm not going to get uh, drowned here. And so this is, this is the role of the antidepressant and, and anti-anxiety medication. It's as if it lets the water out of the bottom of the pool such that we feel relief. It is not, I'm gonna, it is not a happy pill. I'm not going to feel goofy. I'm not going to go, hee hee. I'm not going to be giddy on this medication. It's not going to um, elevate my mood. Hoo hoo. I, I really want you to think about it as, as letting the water out of the pool such that I can finally move about freely. And my goodness, that that is um, that's re that's relief. That's just relief. And because it happens slowly, I may not even realize it. It just kind of, you know, day by day by day, you know, I, there isn't that 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 black cloud over my head. Now, so in terms of how how this uh, how you have to take this these medications as prescribed. Unlike a Tylenol, it, you know, if you take a Tylenol or an Advil for a headache, you, you pop the pill, within 20 minutes it's in your system and it's reached what we call therapeutic level. It's at a peak, the headache goes away, it lasts another eh, three and a half hours, starts to come out of your system, decays, maybe the headache is gone for good or the headache may come back and you need another dose. Antidepressant medication is not like taking a Tylenol. It's not like you take this pill and 20 minutes that water level is down. Uh, in the brain, there's a, the, the brain likes um, 
uh, the purest blood pro possible. So there's something called the blood-brain barrier. And so the blood-brain barrier um, uh, clears or filters or screens what blood and what, what blood particles and what drugs and what medications can get through to the brain. And antidepressant medication wants to monkey with the brain. So the blood-brain barrier says, I don't want you monkeying with my brain even though you might uh, need it. And so the blood-brain barrier does a good job at actually keeping the medication that we want to work out. So what that means is as you take your first dose, a little bit gets in to the brain. You take your second dose, a little bit more, a third dose, a little bit more, a fourth dose, a little bit more, and so on. The fact is, for antidepressant and this class of antidepressant anti-anxiety medication to work, it takes on average six weeks plus or minus two to reach that therapeutic level. Tylenol, 20 minutes. This medication, four, six weeks easily. And so, so many persons will, will start this medication, and if you have a um, uh, a side effect, usually it's dry mouth, a little bit of dizziness, perhaps ringing in the ears, upset stomach, uh, uh, either a loose stool or some constipation, uh, and if you have, and sometimes headache. If you have any of those symptoms, it's, it's typically within the first two weeks, and it's its most severe around a week, week and a half. So people, they start on this medication. They, they may experience, to whatever extent, some side effects. Usually most people don't, by the way, but if you do, that's typically the worst of it. But they don't experience the benefit of the medication. So they say, this stuff doesn't work, it just made me feel lousy, and they stop the medication cold turkey after about two weeks. This is dead wrong. So, so I urge people that if you're going to be on this medication, if your son or daughter is to be on this medication, explain this to them. Go to my website. I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. There's all sorts of articles that will help you with this. And uh, be committed to be on this medication for at least three, four, five months. Be committed because you're not going to know how it's going to work for you until you are on it for three, four, five, six months. So it's going to take that first four to six weeks to, for you to even know if it is working. And typically by the third week, if you were experiencing some of those side effects, typically they subside once you've given it a chance and your body gets used to that. And as it's subsiding, that's when that water level starts to feel as if it's gone from your chin to your neck, maybe to your chest. And it may feel at like your chest or waist around that fourth week mark. That's when you're going to go back to see the doctor with your son or daughter or yourself if, if this is an adult, because uh, this applies to you as well. And the physician is going to assess response to medication. And in all likelihood, there's going to be a medication increase. Uh, physicians today typically you know, give you a, the lowest dose possible, a starter dose on the medication. And that's, that's to help you get past the side effects stage more than anything else. The other thing you have to know is we never know for any particular person just how much medication is enough. Uh, it's not body size. It's not degree of depression or anxiety. It's your own personal biochemistry, and we can't test for that. So this winds up being experimental. So after that first month, you're going to see your physician, the physician and or counselor, I do this as well, is going to ask questions about mood and, and appetite and sleep and, and reassess your, your symptoms and figure out, you know, where are you with this medication, to what degree has it been helpful. And it's likely that we'll want to see a medication increase uh, uh, to, you know, to in a sense bring it to the next level. And then uh, at the two-month stage, we're going to reevaluate again to see whether or not this has been helpful. And, and, you know, it may be at two months or three months, there may have been some more playing with the medication, playing with the dose to figure out what's right for you. The reason we don't want people to stop cold turkey even after two weeks or even after four months or a year 
is because there's kind of a rebound effect. If you stop cold turkey, you actually increase the likelihood of a flight down a down down those stairs of 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 jumping yourself to a depression or anxiety because you have been used to this medication. So if at any time you wish to to remove yourself or your son or daughter wishes to remove themselves from this medication, you do it uh, under medical supervision and it's not uncommon for the doctor to half the dose for two weeks to a month, half the dose again for two weeks to a month and slowly uh, taper you off. And then you'll see, you know, do the symptoms return or do they not? If the symptoms return, it may be necessary to continue the medication. The, the counseling of choice, um, uh, we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is aimed at helping you change the words inside your head, the things you tell yourself. It's really uncommon, it's really common, sorry, for people who are depressed or anxious um, to have a, their own internal script such as I'm bad, the world sucks, or I can't do this, or no one's going to like me. So the cognitive behavioral therapy teaches the individual to be mindful of those scripts running through their head and teaches them new scripts, actually, that you can actually rehearse to tell yourself, to catch yourself, tell yourself something, self something differently, and, and uh, help you control and bring on a different attitude. So cognitive behavior therapy. Having said that, though, though, if there are family issues going on, if there's uh, issues with the parents, with drugs, alcohol, violence, separation, um, problems in their relationship, then you may need some family therapy or the parents to get therapy directly for that to deal with that uh, as well. Um, I want to come back to cannabis abuse. If your son or daughter is is a daily smoker or several times a week over the course of months, uh, they are hooked on this, and they're hooked on this big time, and they're not going to give it up voluntarily, and they're not going to give it up easily. Um, that's just a fact. They're going to lie to you, uh, not because they're bad kids, but because they are psychologically dependent on the substance, and that's what persons do who are psychologically dependent. And so you will not be able to trust that they're abstaining uh, or cutting down from their substance abuse despite what they tell you. So you will have to monitor them. You will have to check their rooms. Uh, some of you may have an issue or your children may have an issue with the lack of privacy. And uh, personally, I just tell parents that on these matters, Prophecy gets thrown out the door. When you became drug dependent, you lost certain rights, and we gained certain responsibilities. So you may have to look through their belongings, and depending on the severity, you may also want to take your child for random drug testing to their physician. Again, I'm going to point you before this is over to some articles on my website. Um, if you're going to go for um, random drug testing, um, if you look at the, the PowerPoint, I just switched, I think, terrible things. You're going for cognitive behavior therapy to deal with those terrible things that you think. If you're going for random drug testing, you're going to ask your doctor, write this down, for a five-panel drug screen. So we're not just going to test for cannabinoids, uh, cannabis, cannabinoids. We're also going to test for alcohol, the cannabinoids, amphetamines, barbiturates, and opioids. It's a five-panel uh, drug screen. If your employer sends you for drug testing, this is what they're sending you for as well, this five-panel drug screen. If your kid is doing um, uh, cannabis on a regular basis, it just increases the likelihood that they're um, playing around with these other drugs as well. So if you're going to know if one is in their system, you better well, uh, might as well know if the others are, are, are there tagging along too. If you go to your doctor and you ask for this random five-panel drug screen, random meaning you can go there and ask for it any time, you want to speak to your physician and, and ask the physician to write on the requisition form that you want the results to be reported numerically. More often than not, uh, the drug company or the, 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 the blood companies, whoever does the, the testing, the lab, sorry, they report 
these drug screens uh, plus a, a positive or negative. Uh, yes, it's there, you failed it. No, it's not there, you passed. Uh, because it's usually for employment purposes. They don't care how much is in your system, they just care, is it in your system? And if it is, you're out of luck. For, for our teens, I request uh, numerical reporting because uh, I want to know the absolute number uh, per milligrams uh, in the bloodstream uh, of any of these substances. And the reason for that is if your kid has been abusing cannabis for several months on a daily or regular basis, it can take, it can take a good month uh, to reach a negative drug screen. So there you're you can take your kid every day and they can be telling you the truth, I'm not doing drugs, yet you'll continue to get a positive result and that won't be reflective of your teen's behavior. So, so with the numerical reporting, you can get a, uh, a number today, Tuesday, go back next week, Tuesday, and get a new number. And what we want to see is that number is in decline. And that way we can give credence to your son or daughter saying, uh, yes, I'm abstaining or I'm doing less, because it will be, excuse me, it'll be reflected in the numbers. So five panel random drug screen, you're going to go to your position, you're going to ask for numerical reporting. Guys, your kids are going to block at this. We don't want to do this. You don't trust me. You're looking in my, in my room. Uh, well, yeah, of course we don't trust you. Uh, you're habituated to drugs. You don't like the language I'm using and describing. But we have to be factual. The degree to which you are inducted and trying to appease your teen around this, the tail is wagging the dog. And these problems continue, uh, in, in my experience, uh, unchecked. So these are tough things to do. And if your kid is that involved, I really do urge you to work with a counselor. Uh, it doesn't have to be me by any means. Consult your physician. Your physician should be aware of uh, services in your community. And, and uh, there are counselors these days attached to many uh, uh, doctor's offices as well. So just to let you know. So um, I'm going to just bring up my website for a second. www.yoursocialworker.com I'm not bringing this up to promote anything. I'm a busy guy. I'm not looking to see you in counseling. I'm bringing this up for your benefit. So as you see the screen, underneath my picture, there's a link that says Parenting and Family Articles. I encourage you to click on that link. And what you'll find is I've authored, under this subject, 143 single-page articles relating to many matters of family life. And so. Uh, as you go through this, right off the top, there's an article, Understanding and Treating Depression. Um, there's other articles as we scroll down. Uh, give me a second here. Ah, treating Teens Who Abuse uh, Alcohol and Drugs. This is going to reinforce some of what I've said tonight. Hooked on Video Games. It's going to talk about, uh, I can't answer, unfortunately, everyone's qu uh, questions. Uh, it, it'll look at uh, video game addiction. It is real. It is a problem. Uh, the words inside of your head, that kind of talks about cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, uh, mom or dad, if you're the happy alcoholic, uh, don't, don't kid yourself, that creates problems. Challenging teens, that's why we're talking tonight. And you know, you'll see that, that these articles are available. They're about 750 words each. They're easy to, to read. You can print them out as one pagers. And this gives forthright guidance, direction, advice about how to handle these particular issues. Uh, I'm a believer that all teenagers should have jobs, teaches them responsibility, the value of money. But you know what? If your teen already has depression, anxiety, drug use, man, getting a job is a formidable task. This article discusses the role a parent can play in, in supporting their, their teen uh, getting that first job. It's not that you are, are doing the interviews for them and phoning up your friends. It's, you know, you'll help organize your team. You'll go over the resume with them. You'll go with them to get it photocopied. You'll take them to the mall or to the garden center or to the fast food court or to wherever uh, to help them hand that out. <clears throat> 
excuse me, I'm losing my voice talking here for an hour. Um, but, you know, drinking and parenting, um, you know, uh, your role models to your kids, so you're going to have to look at that if you're consuming yourself. So uh, there's also something further down here that talks about, uh, uh, give me a second here, is your teen drug dependent? How would you even know? Ha! Huh. Uh, so that might be helpful for some of you. Um, changes in peer group, decrease in school performance, staying out late night, uh, breaking rules, secretive behavior, fatigue, le lethargy, apathy, um, says that they enjoy the drug use, they defend it, um, or adamantly de denies it in a way that's disproportionate to the question, I didn't do that! Uh, well, thy doth protest too much. Um, so as you go through these articles, everything that I've talked about and more is there. And you can even take these articles to, to your counselor and say, here's what I think is going on, can you help me with this? So let me just take a look at some more of these questions. Um, is anxiety often misdiagnosed as ADHD? You know, it can. Uh, a good friend of mine, Paul Ricketts, he's a counselor in private practice here in Hamilton. He calls ADD attention divided by divorce. And so uh, I, we also see ADD or the symptoms of ADD in homes marked by uh, domestic violence or uh, abuse inside the home. So, so there may not be the neurological underpinnings for attention deficit disorder there may be a sociological, a family issue that's giving rise to a distracted teen who, because this is on their mind, uh, can't cope at school and the like. These are fabulous questions. I hope I can keep these and write some more articles based on the questions that you sent me. I also want to point out, I'm the parenting columnist for the Hamilton Spectator newspaper. If I didn't answer your question tonight, Fire it along in an email to me, question at yoursocialworker.com. And I may use it uh, in the Hamilton Spectator. I'm not going to put your name in. I'm not going to put your son or daughter's name in. So we leave out the identifying uh, information so it remains anonymous. Uh, but I'd, I'd love, you know, flood my website with these questions. And I, I guarantee you that I'll be answering them over the course of weeks to months many of that will come through to me. Uh, it's my pleasure to do so. I've been doing that now for six years, 350 columns within the six. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, I want to slowly bring us to a close here. <clears throat> if your kids are on Facebook, if your kids are living on the internet, this is not a good thing if they're, if they're depressed or anxious. They are hooking up with kids like themselves, and they're reinforcing this behavior amongst themselves. Uh, yes, I would limit their exposure to this material. Yes, I know it's a fight. Um, uh, see, this is called the outdoors. I've seen that on my video games. And so, yeah, we want to get people out from behind the screens. Throw away the damn video games. You don't even need to negotiate. Uh, not everything is negotiable. Some things are demands. Uh, when your kids go to school, they're not negotiating with the teacher. When the teacher says, this is the homework, that's the homework. Uh, it's okay to get rid of video games. It's okay to annoy your kid. Uh, if your kid gets violent, some of you are dealing with that. Here in Hamilton, we have Coast. So it is a crisis service. You can phone that 24-7, and a crisis worker may even show up to your home. In Halton, Burlington, you have Rock. Uh, I don't know what it stands for, Rocks, um, Rock Counseling Center. They do a good job there as well. Uh, so avail yourself of these resources. The message I want to give to you is don't be held hostage by an out-of-control teenager, but nor am I encouraging you to get in a fisticuffs with your teenager either. So if your teen is out of control, if they are threatening, destruction of property, vandalism, violence, if they scare you, dial 911. If they say, I'm going to phone the children's aid on you, say, go ahead. You, you will never get your son or daughter well 
if you are being held hostage uh, by them. Uh, and again, please, parents, some of you will have to examine your own behavior. Uh, so if you look at this uh, screen, <laughs> uh, you know, your mother found this in your room. I can't believe you have the call to bring this in. And um, uh, the parents aren't exactly great role models. Uh, discipline and good behavior are the keys to family harmony. So my husband and I do everything our children tell us to do. No, we can't have the tail wagging the dog. You can't be your kid's best friend. You've got to be your parents. I remember uh, my son telling me the stupid behavior he was engaging in. He wasn't a bad kid. He wasn't totally out of control. But he was a kid. That's just a teenager. And I said, you know, son, I don't think that's funny whatsoever. And as you tell me that, I am now going to restrict your access to, to going out and being with those people. And he says, well, I'm going to stop telling you things. I thought you were my friend. And I said, well, you may want to use that discretion uh, because I am not your friend. I am your dad, and I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you as my dad. And therefore, I'm going to take anything you tell me from, from the role of being dad. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this one last thing that I want you to do with each and every one of your son or daughters. I call it guerrilla love. <clears throat> We're all familiar with guerrilla warfare. We sneak up on somebody in guerrilla warfare, and we kill them when they're not suspecting it. Here's guerrilla love. If you're on this webinar with me, you may already have a relationship in disrepair with your teenager. You may be uh, in dire straits. You may feel that there's no good between you. I want you to regain some influence with your kid. I want you to regain the relationship. That's a res parental responsibility to do, not a child responsibility. So guerrilla love is all about sneaking up on your kid when they're not suspecting it and giving them a kiss or a stroke or a compliment. So there is a moment in every kid's day when you know they're not being a little s snot. They're not being persnickety. They're being reasonable. Maybe they just passed you the carrots at the dinner table. Maybe they are taking a look in a textbook. Maybe they are on the computer for school-related purposes. Walk in, walk up to them, look over their shoulder, stroke their head, give them a kiss on the top of their head, and walk away. Don't wonder. Walk away. I want your kid to have the experience where they go, what the heck was that? They may be used to fighting with you. I want, I want you to discombobulate them. I want them to think, what was that? My parent just did something nice, totally out of the blue. I've had parents tell me, there is no such thing as a time when my kid is being good. My kid is that bad, Gary. And so if, if you want to argue this with me, then when your kid is asleep, I mean it, when your kid is asleep, go into their room give them a nudge, and wake them up. And as your kid is awoke and they go, you know, what the heck is going on? What are you doing? Look at your kid and softly, gently, lovingly, quietly tell them, you know, I couldn't help but walk into a room and, and look at you sleeping and just reminisce about how much I love you. Sorry that I disturbed you. And then turn on your heels and walk away. At the end of the day, folks, it's not just about your teen's depression or anxiety. It's about your relationship with them. To help your teen recover from depression or anxiety, it's already isolating. And if they've kind of removed themselves, gotten into persnickety behavior, your relationship with them is decaying. They love you. They won't be able to tell you that in the moment. They need you. They won't be able to tell you that in the moment. So I'm speaking on their behalf right now. I've given you reams of information tonight, reams of information. But I think this is the most important point. You have to demonstrate to your kids. You have to go out of your way and find that moment where you quickly give them a hug, a kiss, a stroke, a kind comment and walk away. We want to leave them thinking about, wow, 
I don't know what that was about, but that felt good. With that, I'm Gary Derenfeld. Thank you for your patience tonight, putting up with me with this webinar and, and my getting used to the technology. I promise I'll be better with the technology uh, in the future. Email me, Gary at your social worker, or I'm sorry, question, question at your social worker uh, dot com. If, if you have difficulty with that, use my personal email, Gary at your social worker dot com, and maybe I can get some of your questions answered in the spectator. Thank you, thank you very much, and I wish you a, a calm, peaceful, safe summer. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Uh, on the bottom right-hand corner in the chat box, I put the email address again for everybody to write down if you did not catch that. We will also uh, post tonight's presentation later on on our YouTube channel. Everybody who was on tonight and signed up will receive an email with the link. So in a couple weeks, if you want to listen to this again, you can uh, watch it again. Gary, on behalf of CPIC, I'd like to thank you. Uh, for joining us tonight, and hopefully you'll join us back another time when uh, we uh, when you have the time. So thank you very much, thank everybody, for joining us, and have a great evening. And hopefully the weather will warm up. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>